Well, g'day curd nerds. Uh, welcome to another episode of Ask the Cheese Man. It's great to see so many people here already. Just uh, make sure that everything in the YouTube world is working. Let's have a look. What's it say? Yep, all good. Fantastic. Um, so, um, let's uh, start the show, shall we? Well, g'day curd nerds. G'day curd nerds. Well, 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 welcome to Ask the Cheese Man. This is episode 68. That's amazing that we've got this far um, in episodes. Um... Oh, my two dogs are having a discussion here. No, it's all right. It's all under control. Okay. Um, shout out so far to uh, who we got. We've got Wendy. We've got Jim. We've got BWG. Uh, we've got Mr. Ricky. We've got uh, Jackson, Thomas, and uh, hello to all of you. Um now, uh, we've got some new patrons this week, which is fantastic. So um, I'll just uh, give those a quick shout out. So thank you for becoming patrons, uh, Carol Avent, um, Brian Hardister, Scott Dallin, and Josh Mayfield. Um, all of you guys um, have uh, started to become patrons of the show. Fantastic. Now, you can also become a patron if you pop over to um, uh, patron, there's a link. Kim will put a link in the show notes somewhere here, uh, down below. I think there's a link as well. Um, so, uh, that'll be fantastic if, uh, anybody wants to join. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, you would have noticed that the podcast episodes have become fairly regular, which is good. Um, I'm getting a regular... Uh, attention, uh, a regular attendance, not attention, uh, to the show. Uh, not only here, but the audio version's been going for a very long time, and a lot of people seem to watch that, which is good. Um, so I'm going to keep doing that, um, and that'll go live my time Wednesday, uh, 12 a.m. So watch for that. Um, this Friday, uh, the video is going to be a brick cheese update, um, just to show you how the brick cheese is uh, traveling in um, uh, in the cheese fridge. And tomorrow, I'm going to try my hand at uh, queso hua. Oh, how do I go, how do I say that? Uh, Oaxaca, ah, spelled O A X A C A. Oaxaca, I presume. Uh, it's a Mexican cheese. It's a Mexican string cheese. So I'm going to see, uh, make sure that is going to be working and uh, put a video up it's probably sometime next week on that one. Um, don't forget that if you, um, you've you got a credit card handy, it's always good. There's a, um, there's a little icon down there with a dollar sign on it. Uh, if anybody wants to during the show, don't forget that you can do a super chat and... Uh, and yeah, any proceeds go to Kim and I, who um, uh, will keep the show running. Um, there's also a new thing on YouTube. I just got invited to it today. It's called Memberships. Uh, very similar to Patreon, but they have a set price every month. Um, and I'm trying to figure out some perks to, uh, to give all people who sign up for memberships on YouTube. So that'll probably go live for me tomorrow once I figure out how it works. Looks a little bit complicated, but I don't think it's probably exactly the same as um, as Patreon, that sort of thing. So that's cool. Um, now, we did have a question early up. Let's uh, grab that one. and That'll be the first one for today. So Mr. Ricky says, Hi, Gavin. I just found your videos and am enjoying watching them. I made my first cheese last Friday, a Parmesan. It is air drying at the moment at 11.5 Celsius. How long before I should vacuum pack it? Um, at that temperature, uh, Ricky, what you could do is uh, leave it for a month as long as you can keep the humidity fairly high. 
Um, it may grow some molds on it, so just um, brush those up with a with a brush or a simple brine solution. And then after about a month, to make sure that it doesn't dry out, then vacuum pack it after about a month. It's good to have a rind, at least you know half a centimetre to a centimetre, um, which is about a quarter of an inch, uh, on the cheese before you vac pack it. It actually tastes a lot better too. Um, so... All right, back down there. So that was the first one. Um, where are we? Debbie. Hello, Debbie. How are you? And uh, uh, Buchenafa, I think that's how you pronounce it, from uh, Algeria. I want to buy a cheese kit. What can I do? Um, unfortunately, um, Algeria is one of the countries we can't ship to. Uh, Australia. We can't even ship via Australia Post, unfortunately. So sorry about that. Um, Jackson says, what is pecan flavour? Uh, pecan means spicy in Italian, and you find cheeses that are uh, long-aged have a pecan flavour. So things like um, Parmesan or Parmigiano-Reggiano um, in its Italian name, um, things like Pecorino Romano um, and those sorts of cheeses, really long-aged and they have a bite to them. So a bit of a bit of a spicy one. Um, Swashed, Swashed Productions says, what stores in Australia are good to pick up basic cheese making supplies like rennet and the cultures, maybe cheesecloth as well? Um, oh, well, Kim's already done that. She's put a link there for you um, to our very own little cheese cheese shop online, littlegreenworkshops.com.au. So um, can't recommend it highly enough because I'm a part owner. <laughs> So uh, there you go. And we ship uh, all over the world, not only just Australia. Okay, Louis says, uh, thanks for the great curd nerd content. I've made three cheeses now because of you. Well, I hope they all turned out all right. Um, and uh, well done you, Louis. Um, John, good day, Gavin. I hope you and Kim are having a wonderful day. In fact, we did. We had a great working day. Thank you, John. And uh, Matthew says, big fan of the uh, triple pepper jack videos. Well, it's actually still air drying. It's, it's, I've got it under my little um, umbrella tent that you would have seen the other day. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to vacuum pack it again. I've decided not to put any more of that Chipotle rub because I did look at the back of it. And yes, it's got salt in it. So that's the reason why all of that whey came out in the bag because um, that powder had uh, salt in it, unfortunately, that I couldn't see. It must have been very fine salt. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think that solves the mystery of why there was all that moisture in the bag. Okay. Um, but there will be more update videos. Um, I'm only going to mature that for three months. So I think the next one for that, um, triple pepper jack will be, um, the taste test video and I'll have to have a pot of yogurt on hand. I think depends on how hot it is and we'll see how we go from there. Okay. Um, Full steam ahead, says Gavin. Where's the best place to get cheese making stuff in the UK? Uh, not sure. Um, never bought anything from there. So there are a few cheese making shops. Just Google them. You'll find them. Uh, cheese making supplies um, UK. And uh, I know there's quite a few there, but uh, I haven't bought from them personally. Okay. Um Bitbug says, it's 4 a.m. in Arizona. Why am I awake? Because you are. And uh, KX Ultimojo says, G'day, Gavin. Have you considered making Roquefort yet? Um, only problem with making Roquefort is that um, you need sheep's milk. Now, I don't have a readily available supply of sheep's milk. Um, if I can get my hands on some again, I've got a, a friend up in uh, New South Wales, who sent me some sheep's milk last time, and I made a Pecorino Romano out of that. Um, yeah, if I can get my hands on some sheep's milk again, or used milk, um, I'm going to make some uh, Roquefort. So, well, in that style, you can't call it Roquefort, because it's a AOC designation. But, yeah, it'll be that style. Um, right, where are we up to? Uh uh, Debbie says, people travel back and forth to the mines in Algeria, may be asked on the travel site. Um, 
yeah, I'm not too sure how it would get there. Um, Matthew says, what easy cheeses can I make with regular milk from Woolies? Um, well, Woolworths have this special milk. Uh, if you have a look at Farmer's Own um, and the unhomogenized version, then that is a pretty good milk uh, with which to make cheese. Um, it has been standardized, but I think the standardized fat content is about, it's about 3.6, which is higher than the normal standardized milk, which is about uh, 3.25, maybe 3.3% fat. So, uh, yeah, I can recommend Farmer's Own. It's a Woolies brand. Uh, Woolies, for all those who don't live in Australia, is Woolworths. It's just a, a supermarket here in Australia. Okay. Um, Amit says, have you seen Alex French guys, French guy cooking video on making mozzarella on at home? What are your thoughts? Well, I did watch his series and I did actually reach out to Alex to see if he needed a hand, but I didn't get anything back. Um, so, and I saw his last video where he made it successfully. It looked almost exactly the same as, um, my quick mozzarella recipe, bar one or two steps, and it looked almost exactly the same. So I might give his version a go, um, just to see, uh, if it tastes any different than my quick mozzarella recipe. And that's certainly what he made. He didn't make, um, uh, traditional, uh, mozzarella uh, with cow's milk. So, um, yeah, I think it was, my thoughts were it was a bit of a storm. I, I, I know that he acts for the camera and he's an actor as well as a cook, right? But um, some of it looked a little bit, well, how I say fake. Um, but it was a good little series. I liked the trip to Italy and uh, and seeing how he, um, and he, how he, uh, Got some tips and stuff on how he saw real mozzarella made. Anyway, that's my thoughts. Okay. Um, uh, yep. Kitty Cat says she highly recommends our online store. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, Kitty Cat does buy stuff from us, which is great. Uh, EJ said, watch your Yalesburg making video the other day, and now I'm addicted. Hello from Wales. Hello to you. Um, Yalesburg is a great little cheese to start off with. It's probably best, well, in our climate anyway, it's best to make in spring and autumn because then you have actually have days that are about 18 degrees Celsius, which it needs to form the eyes. So um, summer here is just too hot to make um, Yalesburg. So spring and, and autumn for us is perfect temperatures. Okay. Um, uh, the underdog is here. Hello from England. G'day to you. Um, what's that? Macadamia. What is the longest you have aged a cheese? 18 months and it tasted fantastic. It was a, uh, it was something. Um, what the heck was it? Um, oh, I can't even remember. Manchego. That's, that's what it was. It was a Manchego using, um, cow's milk, uh, and not sheep, sheep's milk. Um, 18 months, it was just absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, I should come to Cardiff High School. Why? Um, Brian says, what's the longest time you aged your cheese? Just answered that one. Um, Debbie, my mozzarella went very rubbery. Any idea what I did wrong? Um, if it was quick mozzarella, then usually too much rennet makes it go rubbery instead of, um, you know, creamy texture. Uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe ease off on the rendered a little bit, um, only, only by say 10% and, uh, and see if that makes a difference. Um, what's the hardest cheese ever made as in the most difficult, um, because the most difficult cheese I ever made and didn't really prepare for was provolone and you I've made two videos on how to make provolone. The first one worked. I got a result. Um, but the way I went about it probably wasn't how I should have done it. I should have just waited. And one of the things with pasta filata cheeses, and hopefully I'll perfect the um, Oaxaca tomorrow when I make it, is time. You really just need to let the curd sit there and acidify and not rush it and just leave them be 
and then come back to them, test them, see when they're about uh, 5.1, a pH of 5.1, and they'll be acidic enough then to stretch. Um, because every other time I've made um, pasta filata cheeses, besides uh, the mozzarella that I made, uh, I kind of rushed it, I think. You know, I'm just too impatient when it comes to that sort of cheese. So I'm just going to, tomorrow, I'm just going to ease into it, relax, let it do its stuff, and not panic too much. Okay. Um, and the hardest, as in the rock hardness, was probably the first Parmesan I ever made. Uh, it actually had, it was a, a butyric late blown cheese. So it puffed up in the middle. So it went from being a nice overly sort of shape and then whoop, like that. And all that was left was the rind, about that much rind, and the rest was hollow. And it was hard as a rock. Um, so, yes. So there's the two terminations of, determinations of hardness. Okay. Um, when will the triple jack cheese be ready? Hang on, I know that one. It's back in my cheese log here. Triple jack is due to be tasted on the 16th of September. Um, and people have been asking me about my uh, Parmesan. Uh, that is also ready to be tasted uh, first week of September. So another month to go on that one. Uh, so, yeah, that'll be good. Okay, um, David, good to see you online here, David, and Diana, hello for you. Um, September underdog, I believe. Yes, yeah, September is correct. Uh, what's the best pairing for Havarti, as in wine? Um, I think you mean wine, as far as pairing goes. Uh, for Havarti, I would go, because it's such a soft and sweet sort of cheese, it's, it, when you, it's not very acidic, right? I would pair it with, say, a, uh, a nice Chardonnay, or maybe even, you could go as far as Moscato, which is very, um, ooh, very sweet. Um, any sort of sweet, light white wine would go very well with Havarti. Um, but then again, it's up to individual taste. You could drink a hard red wine with Havarti and it wouldn't make any difference. Um, but yeah, I think white wine. Uh, and on the sweeter side, so maybe like a, 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 a Gewürz Tramina. A Tramina? Yeah, Tramina Riesling, yeah. Um, something like that, that would be very nice with it as well. Uh, Matthew says, uh, when making the provolone, was the rind meant to be that hard or deep? Um, probably not. Because it was such a small little thing, um, I could have eaten it a lot earlier and the rind wouldn't have been as thick. I think the rind was about uh, a whole centimetre, um, something like that. So it shouldn't have been. It should have been just half a centimetre, which is... Uh, what's that? Five mil, uh, three eighths of an of an inch, roughly. Um, Ryan says Havarti should be tasted with farmhouse ale or something with a bit of acid gets the fats mo moving. Uh, not much else going on with Havarti. Um, yeah, I suppose. But like I said, it's an individual taste. Um, Macadamony. Uh, said, will you ever make a dedicated uh, cheese cave slash room? Um, probably not, because the way um, I make cheese is that I'll make I'll make a cheese as I pulled one out of the out of the cheese cave, and then backpack that for long term storage in the kitchen fridge. So the kitchen fridge builds up, and then we have a you know, we'll have a party or something and I'll bring out a cheese platter and I've got, you know, three or four, uh, sometimes even five cheeses for everybody to eat and demolish. Uh, and nine times out of ten, there's nothing to put back into the fridge. So um, I'll never need a, a, a cheese cave. Maybe a bigger fridge. I could always do with a bigger fridge, but I just don't have the room um, here to, to do that. Um, one... Thing I was going to mention, there is, um, there's been a request, um, a guy called Ricardo, I think I answered a question on the podcast the other day, and he's struggling with measurements. So he wants, 
I'm not sure if they have measurement spoons in Brazil, where he comes from. Um, and uh, he wanted me to do a quick video about um, metric equivalents to um, teaspoons, tablespoons, and cups, that sort of thing. So I know there's probably heaps of that sort of stuff on the internet uh, on YouTube already, but I, I think a nice little quick video will be fine. Um, and I'll even do the mini measuring spoons, which is so small, um, it'd be very hard to um, to take measurements of. But I think something simple like that would help people. And uh, uh, any questions that came up like that, of that nature for, say, the Ask the Cheese Man show, then I could just simply direct them to that video. So any thoughts on that would be cool. Um, so I was going to do that sometime next week. I'll Put it up and schedule it later on okay um will the live streams ever move back to the cheesy chair of wisdom uh good good question problem with sitting in the cheesy chair of wisdom uh which I, i'll try and do that right now is that you can't hear me <laughs> and that's probably half the problem Anyway, um, back back here again. Uh, yeah, and the problem is by sitting there, I can't read your questions on the screen. So unless I bring the cheesy chair of wisdom a lot further, closer to the computer. So maybe not. Um, Lindsay, good question though. Lindsay says, um, I've noticed recently that some recipes found online talk about flocculation time and the flocculation multiplier. I have done some searching uh, why don't we hear more about this subject? Um, good question, because usually it's made by commercial cheesemakers, and usually when you're making such small batches of cheese, you really don't need to worry about flocculation time. However, if the lovely Kim is available there, could you please put up the link to a blog post I did on littlegreencheese.com about flocculation times. Um, you should be able to find that there. Um, so uh, yeah, and there is the little multiplier table and there's even a little video on how to do it. Uh, so yeah, check those out. Um, okay, next question. How do I mature a cheese without a cheese cave? Well, there's quite a few cheeses you can make without having to need a, a fridge, right? A dedicated fridge for that sort of thing. In fact, um, and Kim, I don't know what you're doing, love, but uh, here's another one for you. Um, if you can find the link to the YouTube video, Beginner's Cheeses That Don't Need a Cheese Fridge, um, and that will, um, uh, that'll help out. Who am I helping out? Um, Jackson, so yes. Um, Debbie says, do you stock those spoons? Uh, yes, we stock the mini measuring spoons which go from a quarter of a teaspoon down to one sixty-fourth of a teaspoon. Uh, very minute little measurements. Uh, great for starter cultures, that sort of thing. Um, how do I spell what? Um, flocculation. F-L-O-C-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. Flocculation. I think that's right. Um, or just put flock. I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, okay, yes, so we do we do um, stock those, and we also stock some standard measuring spoons that they have here in Australia as well. Okay, um, and all you have to do is go over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au and you'll the cheese making section. Look at, look for equipment, and you'll see all little spoons and stuff. Okay, um, Stuart says, and hello, Stuart. I've had problems getting a firm set on the curds past a couple of days. Um, cheddar and gouda. I use raw milk and don't add calcium chloride, but never have had any problems. It's warm here. Temperature. I've had problems getting a firm set. Past, oh, the past couple of days. Right, not past a couple of days. Um, actually, if you use raw milk, so it depends. So if the milk's fresh as you can get it, you shouldn't have too many problems. It also depends on the lactation cycle of um, of the animal as well. So later in the lactation cycle, so the longer it's been since the animal has calved or kitted or what have you, or lambed, um, the longer 
the lower the amount of protein and fats in the milk, so you actually have to add calcium chloride um, the later in the lactation cycle uh, it, it, it is. So I don't think the temperature's got too much to do it. I think it's probably something that's happening to the milk uh, itself. Okay, um, Brian says, what's your biggest pleasant surprise while you've been making cheese, cheese and the biggest disappointment, I think? as well okay the biggest pleasant surprise was uh the serendipitous invention of farmhouse cheddar blue um what happened was i had a piece of farmhouse cheddar in uh wax paper and i had it in the cheese in the sorry normal kitchen fridge and somehow it got infected with uh penicillium rogue 40 and because there were lots of fine cracks in that cheese when I opened the next piece to eat, there was this beautiful blue flavour all the way through it. So I managed to replicate that. And you would have seen, if you've been on the channel for a while, there's a cheese making video for Farmhouse Cheddar Blue. And that was my serendipitous invention of, of that cheese. I think probably other people make it, but I'm saying it's mine because I've got a recipe and they haven't. Um, and biggest disappointment was probably St. Marcelin. Uh, the ones you make in those little pots, um, it's a little uh, bloomy rind cheese. I think I left it too long and it got really sour and acidic. And even though I ate half of one, my goodness, the taste was foul. Um, just because I could. But um, yeah, that was my biggest disappointment. I thought they were going to be much better little cheeses. Uh, I don't know if I'd make them again. I'd probably, and you can't even buy them in Australia anyway because they're made fresh in France. Okay, um, so thanks for the question, Brian. Very nice. Uh, John, uh, Gavin, I recently opened my Piora, which was vacuum-packed, and there was a light brownish coating, and the cheese overall tasted great but sweet. My wife was worried it was bacteria. Any thoughts? Uh, no, those types of alpine cheeses tend to get a brownish coating on them. I've had the same, exactly the thing, same thing happen with uh, Gruyere, which is in the same family of those cheese. And my Piora, exactly the same. It had a brown, because you're washing it all the time and the makeup of that cheese, the starter cultures you use. Um, yeah, it, um, uh, Kim, flock is spelled F-L-O-C. So <laughs> try that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We can't find it. Um, yeah, so those, the makeup of that cheese, it tends to go brown. So no, it won't be any bacteria. It'll just be a smear that's been spread across the cheese as you've washed it. Um, Stuart says, how do you reuse your saturated brine? If yeah, Oh, do I? Uh, if yes, how often? Um, before every cheese making session, what I do, I kind of pasteurize the uh, brine solution. So what I'll do, I'll uh, put it into a pot out of my brine container that I've stored at 13 degrees Celsius. Sometimes there's mould that floats on top. You scoop that off and basically put it back into a pot, put it on the stove and boil it. So then you're killing off any bacteria that may be in there, especially B. linen scent, tends to hover around in your, um, your saturated brine if you've recently brined a washed rind cheese that has brevi bacterial linens in it. So boil that up and then basically that, let that cool back down um, I just usually put it back into the cheese cave um, and then ready for the next cheese. So that's, and I usually use it um, for a fair while until it starts to smell cheesy, if you know what I mean. Um, then I know I've used it too much and then salt costs nothing. Um, just make up a new batch. I only make up two litres of brine at a time anyway. And, uh, and away you go. So probably use it i would reuse a brine about four times that's that's how often i would use it by using that method boiling boiling the brine letting it cool down again and then you can put the cheese in away you go okay um thanks for that link honey appreciate it um charles asks can a small amount a couple of ounces of raw milk replace a starter culture also does freezing raw milk have a negative effect on its usefulness for cheese. Um, I have received frozen milk 
frozen raw milk from um, uh, friends, and it works fine. It really does. It, the milk, as long as it hasn't been frozen for like six months, um, if it's just been frozen for transport, perfect. No problems at all. Um, and no, a little bit of raw milk will not replace a starter culture. Really has to be a high count of bacteria in uh, the milk. Um, so if you're um, if you're struggling to find a starter culture, you could use as a mesophilic starter culture buttermilk, and that has an aromatic mesophilic starter culture in it. And you can use um, I can't remember how much I used in um, oh it was nearly a cup, uh, nearly two hundred and fifty milliliters uh, that I used in my um, triple pepper jack, and I used that in place of a starter culture. Um, and when I made uh, provolone, I used a, a Bulgarian-style yogurt um, I made up, which is called a tangy tangy yogurt culture, um, and that's a fast acidifier, so uh, that worked really well for that cheese. But, uh, yeah, a little bit of raw milk won't help if you're adding it to, say, pasteurised milk. It just won't grow the, um, won't grow the lactic bacteria fast enough. Um, Luke says, um, hi Gavin, I've been making Italian cheeses and I'm ripening and something M ripening containers seem to build up with so much condensation. All my cheese is stunning at blue molds and gray molds. I wash regularly with salt brine. Um, yes, they do build up with a lot of condensation because, uh, that's why, <laughs> that's why, um, in the first couple of weeks, um, the condensation is actually uh, water that's being drawn out of the cheese as it uh, as it starts to dry out. So in that first two three weeks, you've really got to check it once a day. Um, and maybe I'm not making that clear enough in the videos, but yeah, definitely most of the cheeses, especially the really uh, moist ones, will um, have a lot of condensation on the on the lid and unfortunately that builds up and drips onto the cheese and makes it go really soft so that's really bad so if you can get to it before it drips onto the cheese then that's that's a lot better um, Declan says hi Gavin Melbourneian here how old were you when you became a cheese aficionado oh, aficionado sorry um, how old was I oh I've been making cheese since 2009, uh, so that was um, eight years ago. I was 46, 46 when I started making cheese. Um, so that was when I first made my first feta, and I certainly was not a cheese aficionado back then. Um, it's just taken time by going through this the process by making cheese every week by reading books you know you can see here I've got mountains of books that I've read um, on the subject um, and also looking at um, how commercial operators work and getting that sort of information especially from videos there's so many videos on YouTube about commercial cheese makers and how they make their cheese um, so you get kind of little tips on how to do it yourself here at home um, but it's practice, really is. Like any skill, uh, perfect practice makes perfect or even bad practice makes perfect because you know you, and you learn from your mistakes. So thank you, Declan. Very good question. Um, my goodness, we've got lots of things happening here. Uh, where are we? Where did I get up to? Right, um, Swifton says, G'day, three more days and I get to crack it over my bell easy. I can't wait. I think I'm going to cut it into quarters, eat one and then backpack and mark the other three at two-week intervals. Um, do you think that's okay? I see in the instructions you recommend aging for a further two to six weeks if wanted. Yeah, that would be fine because that's exactly what I did because it was such a big cheese. Um, we uh, ate quarter of it probably within a week uh, and then I backpacked the other pieces and kept them in the kitchen fridge as well. And then just open them up. So that way they won't get mould on them and all that. And they won't dry out. So, yeah, really good plan. That's what you should do. Um, uh, Dylan says, my Gruyere is a couple of weeks into maturation. It feels a little squishy to touch. Should it be very firm or do I have a problem? 
Uh, yes, you could have a problem because it is supposed to be fairly firm. Um, it will dry out a bit. If, if you think it feels squishy and it's wet to touch, uh, Dylan, then I would air dry it for a couple of days just to get a bit of moisture out of it. Um, if you if it's a cold or just take it out of the maturation box whatever you do um and then just have it into your um your cheese fridge whatever however you're maturing it um and let it dry out a little bit and see if that helps um but uh, otherwise there's probably too much in there um charles thank you very much for that uh, super chat i really appreciate it okay um where am i up to uh, Raymond says, Hi, Gavin, I'm wondering, is there a mild strain of blue mould that isn't overpowering that I could use in a farmhouse blue? Uh, in fact, there is. Um, we actually sell two strains of blue mould. There's a mild one and a strong one. So you can pop over to the website and have a look. Uh, that's littlegreenworkshops.com.au um, and go to the cultures and moulds and you'll see both of them there. I think they're both in stock. So, yes, there is a mild strain. Okay. Um, Emily says, can you put sugar in milk before the, adding the culture when making yogurt? Um, you can, but what happens is the, um, the uh, lactic bacteria will eat some of that and uh, make your uh, yogurt a little bit more acidic. But uh, you actually, on the... When I made soya yogurt, you have to put sugar in it or it won't ferment um, and it won't go thick and make yogurt. Um, when you're using normal um, milk to make uh, a yogurt, um, it's best to bring the temperature of the milk up to about 80 degrees Celsius first, 80 to 90 degrees, and then bring the temperature back down to the temperature to put the starter culture in. That way you're going to kill all the bacteria that may be lurking, just in, even in the pasteurized milk. Um, because uh, you don't, you want your yogurt culture to have the best head start you possibly can. You can put some sugar in there if you want. I wouldn't put more than a tablespoon. Um, and it, it wouldn't be to sweeten it. It's best to sweeten it afterwards. Um, okay. Uh, Quinlan says, I have just started watching. And I want to say that your videos are great. And I'm excited to watch more. Thank you very much, uh, Quinton. Um, okay, Pi, hello. How are you? Uh, Joan and Joan and Joke, what do you call, why do you know why it's called cheesing? Right. Um, Jeremy says, uh, how long can I keep, uh, cheese culture? Also, I love your content. Keep up the good work. Um, cheese cultures can be kept for... Uh, up to one year. So what we do, and I don't have one with me, why not? Um, little, you know, those little yellow sample jars, little sterile containers. Those packets, as soon as you snip them open, don't fold them down and try and put a peg on them or seal them that way. Put them in a sterile jar with a little yellow lid, screw it on tight, put it in the freezer, and make sure you write on it, of course. Um, that's the best way to store them uh, for long term. And you, they will last at uh, minus 18 degrees Celsius for up to two to uh, one to two years. So um, they're, they're fine if you keep your cultures like that. Um, Alexander says, I like cheese. Me too. Uh, Matthew says, would I ever try uh, Kazumazu? Um, no, I wouldn't. Don't think I ever would. Um what are you up to? Uh, Alexander says, have I ever made Serbian cheese? Uh, does it have a name? Because I'm not sure. Um, Pedro says, have you experienced Brazilian cheese? Um, there's a cheese called Minas, uh, Minas something. I'm not sure. I don't have a recipe because it's a raw milk cheese made in a, uh, a state of Brazil. And they're fairly high up, so it's fairly cool. So, no, I'm not too sure. I haven't got a recipe and I've never tried it because I probably don't import it into Australia because um, it's a raw milk cheese. Unfortunately, we have these really strict laws. 
Okay. Um, Keepy says, are there any good tips to make a super sharp cheddar? Is it all about the aging process? I've had a 25-year-old cheddar and that tasted amazing, but I can't wait that long for a taste. Yes, it is. It's all about the affinage or the um, the a, the maturation process and what you do with that cheese um, after it's been made. Super sharp cheddar, uh, 25 years old, must have been very expensive because people to have to take care of that cheese to make it that sharp. It's all about aging. It's all about the enzymes left over from the rennet and the dead lactic bacteria that act on the fats and the proteins to make those amazing flavours, and it just takes time. Muhammad says, Gavin, any idea to make more humidity in my mini bar? Thanks for thanks in advance. Um, yeah, look, basically, I don't. I don't make my mini fridge um, or cheese fridge or whatever you want to call it humid at all. I put them in ripening boxes. So just a plastic tub with a mat in the bottom that keeps the cheese off of the floor of the plastic tub, has a lid on top, and uh, that's my ripening box. And the humidity builds up in those ripening boxes. Mark my words. Um, I've had a hygrometer in there, thermometer hygrometer, and it sits at the same temperature as the, as the fridge that it's in. And the relative humidity is about between 85 and 95% relative humidity. So use ripening boxes. You don't have to worry about raising the humidity in your cheese fridge. Um, Amethyst um, says, is too much mould on blue cheese safe or should I re remove the mould part? Um, it's definitely safe. It's up to you. If you're allergic to penicillin, then you may have a mild reaction. But um, And remember, I'm not a health professional either, so I can't recommend that. I find the, the flavour really overpowering. So you may have seen in the taste test for the farmhouse cheddar blue, you would have seen that I scraped off most of the blue mould on the outside of that cheese. Uh, I didn't have to, but I chose to because I don't particularly like a really strong rind. So I scraped all of that off and discarded it. I could have used it for another blue cheese. I could have used all that stuff I scraped off. Um, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, but uh, I was after the flavour on the inside, and I got it. I got the mar blue marbling in the farmhouse cheddar blue. I think if I aged that cheese probably another two, three months, I probably would have got more blue cheese marbling. But, um, yeah, definitely I would have still scraped off the, uh, the mouldy bits of the blue. Um, uh, Kitty Cat says, I may just be brave and try a little mold yes it it but it's really strong unfortunately um okay um what's that pontus gavin do you know when cheese making equipment pack will be back in stock um we're actually waiting for some cheese boards unfortunately that's what the hold up is and they're not in stock so uh when they do uh pop over to the product page there's a little place where you can um, press a button that says wait list and if you join the wait list as soon as it goes back in stock you'll um, you'll get notified via email uh, Jackson my super chat is not working uh, it probably won't if you don't have a credit card um, Matthew says a cheddar uh, with cheddar are there ways to get a sharp cheddar with less aging no not really um, definitely not with cheddar it, it's definitely is age and that's how you know all those age vintage vintage cheddar is um one to ten years or something um so a mild cheddar would be three months old a um, tasty cheddar would be about six months old and then a vintage cheddar a year and above um and a grandfather cheddar whew, very long time okay um Jeremy says, you should be known as cheeses ah, because you're a cheese god. Thank you very much. Um, Matthew says, like artificially. No, I don't know any way to artificially speed up time. Um, I'll leave that for the people in Star Trek. Um, uh, okay. I don't know Arabic, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to translate that. 
because I can. Um, two seconds. My internet was working faster. I'll be able to do it. Muhammad Salama. Sorry, I got it. Muhammad Salama. Uh, nice work. I want to thank you for everything you do. And I want to know about your Gruyere cheese in Turkey. It's called, oh, in Egypt, Turkey or Rumi. If not, can you make Rumi for us? Uh, that is a cheese name. I'll find out. But I know Egyptians actually do have some of their own unique cheeses, which I certainly don't find in the Western world anyway. Um, why is the leathery mould part on the outside of the brie in Camembert? That's because Penicillium candidum, which is the main component on that leathery mould part, as you call it, um, it uh, it ripens the cheese from the outside in. Uh, so that's unique. Mold ripened cheeses tend to do that, um, ripen from outside in. Um, and it's something you should eat. It is very good for you. Uh, Matthew says, can we have a cheese off? Don't know about that. Um, K Pi says, Miss Weber, do you prefer backpacking cheese or waxing when aging cheeses and why? Okay. So when I vacuum pack a cheese it's got to be firm it's got to be a, a hard cheese a semi-hard or a hard cheese um, when i wax a cheese i prefer to wax cheeses that are fairly soft um, but they have been pressed so cheeses like havarti uh, edam uh, gouda um, those styles of cheeses that are a bit softer because they've had the the curds washed um, I tend to wax those cheeses and they turn out a lot better because if you backpack them, what tends to happen is the pressure of the vacuum pack squishes the cheese down uh, a lot flatter than what it should be. So um, I, I only uh, vacuum pack harder cheeses and uh, wax um, softer cheese, softer semi-hard cheeses. There you go. There's my determination. Um Uh, good day, Curd Nerds from Rick. G'day, how are you? And what time is it? Oh, we've got 10 minutes to go, Curd Nerds. So grab your questions, make them quick, because uh, I haven't got many left. Much time left. It's nearly time for bed. Um, Ponta says, um, I know you like cheese a lot, but more got you... Oh, what? What made me got into cheese making? Expensive, hard to find in my area, thanks. Um, no, basically what I, I wanted to know what was in my food. So um, I had grown up on a dairy farm when I was a child and we never made cheese because we just didn't know how to. Um, so mum and dad and all that sort of stuff didn't know. Um, so um, I wanted to make my own cheese from locally sourced milk um, which I ended up finding was very hard to do. I do have a local source of milk now, and they're actually um, supporters of the channel, uh, and that's Ingle Nook Dairies. Um, they send me all my milk for free um, for a quick shout-out on the uh, the cheese-making video. So locally made milk about uh, 50 kilometres away from me, so fantastic. Um, so that's why I started making cheese myself, because I wanted to make it and know what's in it. Um, and we've got somebody from Greece saying hello. Um, I'm not going to translate that. Um, Rick says, Gavin, is there a way to test rennet for viability? Uh, yes, there is. Now, how do you do it? Um, you take a cup of, uh, sorry, a quarter of a cup of milk. So that's 60 milliliters, uh, two tablespoons of milk. And you warm it up to about 30 degrees Celsius which is about 95 Fahrenheit, roughly, maybe lower, lower. Um, anyway, don't, I'm not doing it in my head. Um, and you put in about three or four drops of rennet, uh, wait about 30 minutes, and if it works, if the rennet works, then it's fine to proceed with. If it doesn't, either there's something wrong with the milk 
or there's something wrong with your rennet. Okay, uh, Matthew says, favourite cheese for a party? Raclette, of course. <laughs> yeah, having a raclette party was one of the one of the great things we did this year. I really enjoyed that. And uh, if I ever get the time to make a second raclette, in amongst making a fresh cheese just about every week, um, I'd do that again because it was absolutely delicious. Um, grilled and then put onto uh, potatoes and little gherkins and that sort of stuff. It was pretty cool. Uh, Johan says, I find that Gouda cheese in the shops nowadays tastes more plastic and rubbery. Um, is there a reason for this? Well, probably because they're not making it the traditional way as they do in Gouda in the Netherlands. Um, there's a lot of cheeses on the supermarket shelf that pretend to be something they're not real. Uh, for instance, if you taste Havarti, I'm going back to Havarti a bit today, um, and buy it in the supermarket, it tastes nothing like Havarti that you make yourself. Um, if you buy a Swiss cheese in um, in the supermarket, it tastes, and, and it's been sliced, and it's got eyes in it, it tastes nothing like, um, say, Emmentaler or the, any of those Alpine cheeses that you make yourself, even Yalesburg. Yalesburg kind of does because it's a proper name, um, and that comes from um, uh, Norway, of all places. Um, so, yeah, that does taste good. So, Okay, um, Jeremy says, what's my favourite cheese of all time? Um, so many, so many. Jeremy, um, here's two cheeses that stand out for me. Um, Tilsit was the very first washed rind cheese that I ever made with Brevi bacterial linens, and it blew my mind, blew my freaking mind. It was so nice because uh, I'd never been able to get hold of any washed rind cheeses here in Australia. Um, and then the next one that blew my mind was when I created the Bloomy Goat Blue uh, cheese that had um, ash all over it and it grew a bloomy white rind and that blew my mind as well. So there's two favourites that um, if I had time to make, I'd do it again. Um, Brian says, wax or vac pack uh, Yalesburg? Definitely wax because when you make Yalesburg, as you know, it creates eyes and the wax, if you vacuum pack it, it cannot make the eyes or not big enough anyway. When you uh, wax it, it's got room to expand, expand as it does in the wax. It may split the wax, but then you just quickly um, re-wax the cheese um, if it has a bit of a runaway. And if it does split the wax um, when it's doing its eye formation, then it's obviously too warm and it's making the eyes too quickly. So uh, I would re-wax it and then shorten its uh, eye formation time, pop it straight back into the cheese fridge, to let it settle down again and then do the rest of its um, stuff there. Um, uh, uh, Keepy says, and lastly, I just wanted to say, I appreciate your post and input on the Learn to Make Cheese group on Facebook, Mr. Weber. Lots of people look forward to your posts and insights you provide there. Well, thank you very much. I do like popping over there once every so often, probably not as much as I can because running this YouTube channel is nearly a full-time job besides running our, um, our little online store. Uh, but, yeah, I get over there when I can. Uh, Matthew says he likes raclette as well. Bart says, g'day from Manitoba, Canada. Thanks for sharing all your cheese and knowledge. Hope you're feeling better. I have good days and I have bad days, but uh, more good days than bad at the moment, so that's really good. Um, uh, Matthew says, are there any Australian cheeses or Australian cheese history? No, not a lot, um, because we've only been, well, the population of non-Indigenous Australians have only been here like 200-something years. Uh, there hasn't been time for a cheese history. There are some unique cheeses that people make in styles of cheeses that are European, for instance, um, but there are lots of, uh, of cheeses that are made here by artisan cheesemakers that are unlike things I've ever seen before. So some pretty cool stuff. Uh, you just got to find them. That's the hard part because you can't find them in supermarkets and stuff like that. Um, anyway, six minutes to go. Jim says, what's the best cheese for melting on burgers? I would say any kind of Swiss cheese, um, any type of 
sharp sort of cheddar. That milk's fantastic. It has a great flavour. And what else would I put on a burger? Um, that'd be probably it. Gruyere, maybe. Really nice, melted, lovely. Uh, and rack lead, of course, if you can get your hands on that. Um, uh, Major Ob says, our um, uh, market milk is not less than 3%. Can I do with, with cheese with it? It's not less than 3%. Yes, you can. Um, you'll probably have to increase the volume of milk if it's at just 3%. But, yeah, try my, my, any of my 10-litre recipes and you should be fine. Um, all righty. We'll wrap it up now. We've only got five minutes to go, but I'll call it early. Um, thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you. Who was the super chatter? It was Charles. Thank you very much, Charles, for the super chat. Still a little bit of time. If anybody's willing to throw a buck my way, that'd be lovely. Um, oh, Carol. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, uh, and uh, Kim's putting the links up. So don't forget if you want to buy any kits, supplies or equipment, we ship all over the world, except for a few countries like Algeria, unfortunately. Um, littlegreenworkshops.com.au and you can support us on Patreon. And very soon we will be... Um, I'll be launching memberships on YouTube. So it'll be a memberships, a join button, and I'll have some little perks and stuff. Um, what are my thoughts on Mersey Valley Club Cheddar? Not too bad. Um, I have tasted it before, and it does taste quite nice if it's the aged one. Um, and any merch you want to get, like the cup, uh, certified curd nerd, um, and T-shirts and aprons. Aprons are very popular too. Go to cafepress.com.au uh, or .com, and it's Cheese Man TV is the name. A good night, Gavin. Kisses. Kisses to you. See you later. Um, have a good one, everybody, and um, I really do appreciate it. you turning up week after week um, and asking me questions. It's fantastic, and uh, not only do I learn stuff because I have to go and research stuff if I don't know it, because that's what I usually do, um, uh, it also helps the show flow better. Um, you notice by the amount of questions, they're just right. It's just perfect. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and we will see you next week, health willing. Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Well,